George, you've been dealing with cosmological subjects for more than half a century. I've been following it for that period of time, and we've seen this remarkable advance in measurements and precision. Uh, and at the same time, some what seem to be some astonishing ideas have become mainstream. Inflation theory, how the universe began, uh, multiple universes have gone from science fiction to metaphysics to conventional wisdom again. So what seems to be emerging is this sort of a philosophy of cosmology. How, how do we analyze cosmology to, in this time of, of, of really dramatic transformation? I think we've got to recognize that <clears throat> we're coming at a certain level to the limits of what we can see in the following sense, that we can see anything which comes towards us at the speed of light, and that will be electromagnetic radiation, X-rays, ultraviolet, and so on. But we cannot see further than that. Now, we have seen out to the last scattering surface where the cosmic microwave background radiation was let free by the matter and come traveling towards us. That is the furthest matter that we will ever see by any electromagnetic radiation. We're seeing a lot of much more detailed data about that radiation. Um, we're measuring its polarization, its power spectrum, and so on. But we can't see any matter which is further out than that. And philosophy of cosmology is going to have to get to terms with that fact that there is this visual horizon, and that's the limit to what we're ever going to be able to see. So what's the implication of that for uh, cosmological theory? Well... <coughs> If one starts positing theories of what lies beyond the visual horizon, they're not testable in the conventional sense. And so if you're going to produce a multiverse theory, and there are now, as you've implied, a great many multiverse theories, um, we can't see those other universes. We can't um, interact with them. There, there are a number of cases where we have some interaction with them in potentially, which is that it's possible that two bubbles in the multiverse might bang up against each other and leave some signals, but that's a very small fraction of all possible multiverses. So if we were to ever see that in a convincing way, that would be convincing observational evidence that the multiverse exists. Um, even if we could only see one or two other bubbles, that would be... Uh, pretty convincing. If we don't see them, it says nothing, and the multiverse enthusiasts will still say, yes, we're in a multiverse, we're just in a multiverse where those collisions aren't happening or not, aren't happening often enough. Well, uh, the motivation why they come to a, a, a multiverse is, is, is multiple. It's, yeah. And it, it, on the w one hand, it, is, it seems to be the forced consequence of inflation theory. So we have to talk about that, yeah. of how this universe uh, started. So inflation is overwhelmingly now, at least among cosmologists who are my friends, I don't know what kind of circle I, <laughs> I move in, but among my, the guys I know, and girls, uh, this is the conventional wisdom. This is how it happened. This solves all the problems, horizon problem, flatness, all, yeah. all the different yeah. problems. And, and the multiverse is a natural consequence of that. There's another motivation that seems to be that um, driven by fine tuning that says, how do you get fine tuning? And that yes. drifts. So there seems to be two independent Correct. ways of getting at the multiverse. Yes. So it's. Yes. So the first one is through inflation. And I think it's important to understand. As we just heard in a talk today by um, Jerome Martin, that not all inflationary models lead to a multiverse. It's a subset which lead to them. And in fact, even within those that do lead to a multiverse, there are several different kinds of multiverse. Um, anyhow, the bottom line is that the fact that we have inflation makes a multiverse a possibility, but not a necessity. The second point is that the philosophical motivation is for fine-tuning and particularly the cosmological constant. And very briefly, if the cosmological constant was very much bigger than it is, we wouldn't be here because structures wouldn't have formed. And so we want to explain why that should be the case. Um, that is a philosophical justification. And so the question that cosmologists have to ask themselves is, if I have a philosophical justification for a theory such as the multiverse, does that prove it exists? And this takes us back to the roots of science. 
does philosophy prove the stuff about the real world? And I think we know the answer to that <laughs> over, um, since uh, the scientific revolution. We've known that you can have any theories you like, but you want to actually be able to test them. Right, right, right. And if you can't test them, then you're stepping backwards a very long way. And so, um, so I've been pushing with other people the idea that we need to be careful with the multiverse of saying they're very attractive philosophically in many kinds of ways, but once you want to say they are an established part of science, you've got to produce some convincing proof. And for many multiverses, it's basically not possible to get that proof. Well, I mean, there are several um, several counters to that. What you say is on the on the surface true, and there's no doubt about it. But then, what do you do? Uh, what do you do at that point? You can. You can uh, give up, which nobody wants to yeah. do. Uh, you can try to find um, uh, other uh, indications in our world that there are that you're saying, yeah. maybe maybe some data. Um, uh, but it, it, you can look for coherence. Which of, which of the explanations that you can have seem to be the the most simple? Uh, yes. Occam's razor that yeah. you, you have you, you don't have to multiply entities. Yes. You, I, 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 you can figure out alternatives even if you can't prove them scientifically, and look look which seems more logical. Yes. Um, so Occam's razor you can use in many different ways, and my own view is that. With the multiverse, you are multiplying entities far beyond necessity. You're trying to explain one universe in terms of billions of other universes. A particular point which is very important here, the multiverse literature is replete with the word infinity. Mm. Now, one thing I will say with total confidence is that any theory which talks about infinities of physical entities is not a scientific theory mm -hmm. because there isn't any possibility whatever of proving that an infinity of anything exists. <laughs> doesn't matter how long you've counted how many... <laughs> By definition. By definition, you still haven't made the first step on the road to infinity. Right. So when you're reading the multiverse stuff, watch out for the word infinity, and as soon as you've seen that, put a red mark against this particular theory because infinity is not part of testable science. Now, the other point... It's even self-refuting, people say, because if you have infinities, then you can't even make probabilistic exploitation because anything that can happen will happen an infinite number of times yeah. as, as well as... The, yes. you know. and, and this shows up in the multiverse theory. There's what's called the, the measurement problem, that you try to put measures of probability on the multiverse. Because of these infinities, these measures are all ill-defined, and it doesn't actually produce in any very well-defined way probabilities out of the multiverse. What I, what I have not understood about infinities in the multiverse is the following, that m most of the primary inflation theories say that inflation will go infinitely, will go infinitely in the future, but it was not infinitely in the past. Yes. It had to start yep. at something, at least that's the, the, some of the mainstream theories. And so if it started with something and it's going very, very fast, it's exponentially, whatever it is, it's, it's still, not infinity. Infinity is, is not used as a countable infinity. It's used as a means of saying expanding ex exponentially and, and, and will continue forever. I think that's yeah. what it, well, what it well, means. That's thing, a difference. The thing about that is it may be that it will expand forever, so it will expand to infinity, but the point is that we haven't reached that point yet. That is what it will become potentially yeah. at some time in the future. We aren't there yet, so the universe isn't infinite in time at the present time. Yeah, so how do you, how do you, what's your current position on this totality? What should we do? Um, I think we must keep exploring it. Uh, I think in particular what we need to do is look for other ways of explaining the values of the constants. So for instance, Bill Unruh and colleagues have come out with a very interesting paper recently where they come out with a completely different value, uh, uh, sorry, a completely different way of deriving the cosmological constant, which gives a value like what we see. And if you get such a explanation, then you don't need any of this multiverse stuff to, to, um, to explain it. What I do think is we need to get more clarity on the philosophical issues, and I think it's a complete fallacy to think that the multiverse solves the fine-tuning problem, because all of those problems recur at the level of the multiverse. So I can produce for you a multiverse theory in which no universes allow life. 
or in which many universes are alive. And so your question is, where do the laws of physics for the multiverse come from? Where do the constants for the multiverse come from? Why are they tuned so as to allow life to exist? And so the multiverse does not solve any fundamental issues. The fundamental options are pure happenstance. It just happened to be that way. Um, inevitability, it had no other option to being that way. It is high probability, it was very probable it will be that way, which is basically the multiverse option. And then a design or intent kind of thing that somehow or other something intended that it would be that kind of way. Now the, the physicists by and large don't like the last one because it's taking them outside the domain of physics. And their assumption is that physical causation is the only causation at work in the universe. Now. That is manifestly a false statement within the universe. Whether it applies to how the universe came into existence is a separate kind of issue.